Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. The McLean Family Band is one of bluegrass music's most notable and internationally recognized groups that hails from the hills of Kentucky. Established in 1968, they have performed in all 50 states and 64 countries. Some of the venues they've performed at are the Grand Ole Opry, Carnegie Hall, Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Lincoln Center, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Carter Family Fold. They've also been featured on numerous popular television and radio stations, including NPR, NBC's Today Show, CBS Morning News, ABC's Good Morning America, and many more. After five decades of making creative, boisterous bluegrass music together, the McLean Family Band is being inducted into the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame. We are so excited and honored to have them on the podcast. Welcome, Raymond and Ruth, to the podcast. We're so excited to have you guys. Thank you so much for for agreeing to do this. So we'll start off with an introduction. So McLean Family Band has different members, but today we have... Raymond. Miriam, thank you so much for inviting us to take part. Sure. Uh, we're, we're so proud of uh, Lexington, the Lexington Public Library, and on this podcast, we're just glad to be part. Thank Good. you for asking us. Good. Thank you. And Ruth, how long have you been an active member of the band? Absolutely. Well, actually, from the beginning. Nice. I'm Raymond's sister, uh-huh. one, of, one of his three sisters. And we started in the band together about 1968. We had our first television series in Hazard, Kentucky. We were living in Hindman at the time, in Knott County. Yeah, so how many members of the current band well, are the, performing? The original band was our father, uh, Ruth, my sister Alice, and me. Yeah, we, we think of 1968 as being the beginning because that's when we started the television series. We started two weeks after the station went on the air. It was WKYH at that time. Now the, the call letters are WMYT. And the station had been on the air for two weeks. Wow. And uh, Daddy said, son, why don't you go in and see if they want us to play? on the television because they were looking for programming. They didn't have any, it was so new, they didn't have any video recorders yet. Uh, And their cameras were, you know, old uh, tube type (laughs) uh, cameras that had to be dollied. Yeah. Um, Actually, at that time, they just had one camera and it was sitting on portable stairs. It wasn't even on a tripod yet. (laughs) And uh, so I went in and I said to the young lady behind the desk, I'd like to talk to the program manager. And she said, well, okay. Well, I guess that would be me. (laughs) Wow. And uh, I said, well, my family, you know, my father and my sisters and I sing and play music. And I was wondering if you'd like us to do a show. Yes, to, to play on the television. And she said, well, that would be wonderful. I said, wouldn't you like us to audition first? And she said, whoa, yes, that would be a good idea. And she said, I have a spot on Hall's Senior Citizen Corner. (laughs) And I said, well, that would be fine. And so at that time, the the transmitter was up on top of the mountain, up above Gorman Ridge in in Hazard. Hazard, And um, uh, the only road up to it was the, the path that the dozer cut going up to make the foundation and it was raining like crazy so it was very muddy and um, we got there and and drove up we as far as we could and then we had to walk the the last part because it was very muddy and slick and we took the instruments the bass and the guitar and the banjo and and carried them up and we met mr hall he was very gracious and at that time, you just had to stand where the camera showed because they couldn't move the camera. And we, we started singing, and he introduced us. And within about 15 or 20 minutes, a man walked in the door right while we were on the air, and he put out his hand. He said, my name's Bill Gorman. I own this station, and I would like you to give you a 50-year contract. 
He said, for the next 50 years, he said, anytime you want to play on this station, you just walk in and we'll put you on. I don't care. We'll preempt the news. <laughs> Incredible. And, and it was a, a wonderful relationship. We stayed for two years, another two years, and did a weekly weekly show program there until we moved away and couldn't uh, travel back and forth as easily. We always enjoyed uh, that relationship with, at that time, WKYH television. And, and the TV uh, show was just called The McLean Family? or what At that was it time, called? We, we called our band The Bluegrass State. Ah. And by the time we moved, then we were calling ourselves The McLean Family Band. But for the first, I don't know, year or so, uh, we called ourselves The Bluegrass State. Mr. Gorman was very, very good to us, and everyone at the station was. And, of course, very soon they got a lot more equipment, and, and it, it became easier to do the show. They, they, they opened a studio downtown in Hazard, and we didn't have to go up that— uh, Trudge up the mountain. And that's <laughs> right. The transmitter was still up there, of course, but uh, it, was, it was just a, a wonderful experience. And that was the beginning, we say, of the band. You guys must have— always had music in your family to be able to just walk in and say, hey, I, I want to do a show. So what From was the your, time we were yeah, children, so we did, yes. You always had music in your family or My in, earliest the, in the house? My memories are of going to sleep at night and hearing Daddy play music in the other room with, with a lot of uh, other people. And um, riding on my father's shoulders while he danced and sitting on his lap while he played the piano. Those are my three earliest memories of life. And uh, I should let Ruth talk a while. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're doing great, So, Ruth, what role do you play in the the band? Well, I've always been, uh, number one, I feel like supporter of everybody because I feel like we're a team. In whatever we do. And we've always been a team. And it's one of the wonderful things about a band is that you all have separate roles. Yeah. And you work together. And uh, our father used to say that the total is greater than the sum of its parts. Of course. Yeah. And I feel like that is an advantage growing up in a in a team. Yeah. Where you support each other. And family is certainly that way. And so we had the advantage of being a family and a band. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. a wonderful way to grow up. I'm sure it creates a different dynamic mm-hmm. that is a little more tight knit and stuff. So, what instruments? Mm-hmm. I uh, play acoustic guys, bass. Acoustic bass. And mm-hmm. uh, mandolin. And um, we all sing. And we all sing harmony. From the beginning, we all sang harmony. Our father was had a great background in music. Let me let me tell a little more about Ruth, if I may. Ruth has been, from the time she was very young, she's always been determined and capable. And when she was just 13 years old, Daddy received a phone call one day, and it was producers of the National Conference on Children, the White House Conference on Children. And it was going to be televised by CBS. At that time, there were just the three networks. So it was going to be televised on CBS. March Champion was going to be hosting. And they were, they had the script all made for the, for the television and for the opening of the conference. And they'd scripted a 13 year old girl to sing two particular songs and play the mountain dulcimer, sing folk songs. Daddy said, well, probably Gene Ritchie would know. And they said, no, we talked to Gene Ritchie, and she suggested we call you. So Daddy said, well, uh, I don't know any 13-year-old girls who play the Mountain Dulcimer and sing. And so they said, okay, well, thank you very much. We'll keep looking. And about three weeks later, they called again, and they said, we cannot find any 13-year-old girls that play the Mountain Dulcimer and could sing these songs. Do you know anyone who could learn? And the the conference was just in about two weeks, and Daddy said, well, yes, my daughter is 13, and she could do that. And so uh, Ruth has always been uh, up for a challenge. And I would never tell her she couldn't do anything, because if I did, she would do it. (laughs) And so... Daddy called our friend Homer Ledford, who lived in Winchester, Kentucky, a wonderful Kentucky luthier, 
one of our finest. And uh, he probably he made the dulcimer that Gene Ritchie played for many years. He was good friends with everyone in our music community. And Daddy asked Homer to make Ruth a dulcimer, and he made her a beautiful poplar dulcimer in about two days. Wow. And we went and picked it up. Mother made a beautiful dress with a headband and a, for Ruth to wear. Daddy started teaching her to sing these songs and to play the dulcimer, which she did beautifully. So she got to, so when she was 13 years old, she made her debut on network television. Incredible. And <laughs> There are photographs that are just astounding of Ruth standing, uh, sitting on this great big stage with Marge Champion looking adoringly at Ruth and uh, playing and singing. And she opened the entire conference. Um, and Ruth has always, all her life, been able to, uh, to rise to an occasion. And I, I would love to talk for a while about each one of my family who play with us, but I know there isn't time. But no. since Ruth's here, I love I'll... that you can you guys have this relationship, which is a testament to what your parents, I'm sure, instilled in, in you guys. I love that you're, you know, witnessing Ruth's accomplishments and she yours and that's incredible. A testament to your father Raymond as well as your father's name is Raymond. Yes. And uh, Daddy and, and uh, mother always treated us as people. Yeah. They never treated us as a child who was in the way or a child who they always treated us like a musician. If we were playing music, they treated us as a musician. And they encouraged us to treat one another that way. There's a and, mutual respect and and we we have always been blessed with that with that beginning. So it wasn't as if Ruth thought, I'm a child who's going to try to do this. She thought, I'm a dulcimer player. I'm a singer. I'm a bass player. When she started playing the bass, she had to stand on a chair to reach the upright <laughs> bass. And uh, she never thought of it as, I'm a child who's doing this. She thought of herself as, I'm a musician. And I'm going to play no matter that's what. That's right. And well, she... that's the way our parents treated us. They gave us a lot of respect and included us in in the activities and what was what was happening. Um, the original band was our father and my brother Raymond, my sister Alice, and myself. And then during the years, our other sister, Nancy Ann, was part of the band. Our brother, Michael, was part of the band. And our Alice's husband, Al White, at different times, depending on what was going on in lives. And the current band is includes Raymond, my brother, Alice, my sister, and Al, my, Al White, my sister's husband, and Daxon Lewis, our good friend, amazing musician, super, super person, great, great musician. And he is now the director of the Kentucky Center for Traditional Music yeah. at Moorhead State Incredible. University. Well, you guys speak a lot uh, about your father, but Lexington Public Library has a claim to fame to your father. <laughs> <laughs> he worked for the Lexington Public Library. He um, sure did. He was a reference librarian and Kentucky Rube librarian. So talk to us a little bit about his time there. Well, Daddy is a remarkable man. Was He was a remarkable man. He... Uh, was resourceful, he was intelligent, he was talented in any number of areas. When he moved, I, I, I don't know how far back to go, but he was, <laughs> at one point, when I was just born, we moved to Hindman, Kentucky, and we were all raised there. He was so interested in music, and he taught himself to play the accordion because it was portable, uh, he was playing in some places where there wasn't necessary electricity or, uh, you know, any kind of, you know, you couldn't play a record player or that. And he taught himself to play the accordion. He was very good, actually, and a wonderful musician. He was a great guitar player, bass player, singer, piano player. It didn't matter. So he was the director of the Hindman Settlement School in Hindman, Kentucky, from about 1956 till about 1971. And then 
it, the, the president and the dean at Berea College asked him to come to Berea College. He never expected to be a teacher. He was a natural teacher, but he didn't expect to do that and didn't prepare academically to do that. But he prepared, was prepared in life and was prepared in every way, uh, except that he never thought he was going to do that. So he, they asked him to come to Berea College and develop and teach what were the first, the world's first college courses in Appalachian music and in bluegrass music. And he did that in 1971. He did, he did, we did move to Berea and, uh, and he did, he did teach there. And we, he did, he did that, uh, as long as he was able, but we were touring so much and we were so involved with making music with the McLean family band that at some point, he had to make a decision, and he said, okay, I'm going to teach only one semester a year. And he did, and then we would tour the rest of the year. And then he said, well, I could still teach part-time one semester a year, and we could tour the rest of the year, which we did. And then eventually he had people that were, you know, teaching his classes, and we and we toured all the time. And... To the to the point that in in nineteen eighty three, Ruth counted because she had a daughter that was born then, and I had a son that was born then. Ruth, can't we we played two hundred and eighty seven concerts? That is incredible. That year, uh, from the Maritimes in Canada to California to Alaska to Africa. Wow! And uh, and we toured around in Africa a good bit, and actually all the, we played in sixty four countries over time. That's inc- I was reading about that. That's incredible to me. In when you're playing in, in Africa, there was a an audience for bluegrass music. You know what was because there's such good connection with you know, the mu- was, the instruments, right? The people that we the people that they knew in Africa and that they asked us about were people like Jim Reeves. They said, can you sing any Jim Reeves songs? Because uh, Jim Reeves had toured in Africa and had uh, he and... Uh, Which countries in Africa did you guys play in? Well, we played in in Tanzania, Zambia, Chad, Cameroon, Mauritius, the Central African Republic, Congo, Brazzaville, Congo, Zaire, Egypt... Rwanda, Burundi, Liberia, Tunisia, Morocco. Wow. We actually did several tours in Africa. Algeria. We 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 were traveling at that time under the auspices of our United States Department of State. Uh, that was just Africa. Then uh, we were we can talk about overseas touring because that was we were uh, all over Europe, Asia. That's um, incredible. We did an international tour every year for for a number of years, maybe maybe 12 or 13 years in a row. The first was to Italy. We played for the music panel of the National Endowment for the Arts in, in Berea. They met in Berea one year. And part of the, uh, uh, one of the members of the music panel was the composer Giancarlo Manotti. And he came up to us after we played, and he said, I am Manati, like we wouldn't know. <laughs> and, and he said, I have a festival, a music festival in, in Italy, in Spoleto, and I would like to invite you to come. He said, I can't pay you very much, but if you can come, it will change your lives. Yeah. And he was absolutely right. Uh, we did come the next year, which was 1972, and we were there. Uh, we played in Spoleto for two weeks. It did change our lives uh, as a result of that. Well, we started touring internationally, and and I won't go into detail about that because there isn't time, I'm sure. (laughs) But it was very interesting. Daddy was resourceful, amazing. He was able to connect with so many people on so many levels, and through music especially, and um, that started our overseas touring. So how did he do that and work for the library at the same well, time or was it during well, that he, we we was the time? Well, we toured a lot. Uh but we played in all 50 of the United States. Started because of daddy's expertise and ability to connect with people like composer 
Philip Rhodes, uh, with Judy Aaron, who was the one of the managers of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, with Ethel Capps, who was the director of, uh, of recreation at Berea College and, and led the Berea College Country Dancers. Uh, and I, I won't go into detail, but we were played with orchestras. Uh, we were the first bluegrass band to play as a bluegrass band with ma- major works with symphony orchestras. And we did that a lot. We, we, did, we were so busy up through the 80s, uh, up until the 90s. And in, uh, in about 1990, Alice and Ruth uh, had children, and Nancy ended up starting a family. Uh, Daddy had been on the road, you know, uh, uh, quite a lot. We, and so we decided to do some different things. We were working with uh, IMG artists in New York by that time. We didn't have a manager for a long time, and Charles Hamlin and Edna Landau uh, invited us to join. Uh, the, and, and we did On a Handshake. For many years, uh, we did that uh, for uh, oh, probably ten years anyway, and they were remarkable. But so, Daddy went back to the University of Kentucky, got his degree in library science, his master's degree. We all all did different things. Uh, we continued touring, you know, a little bit, but uh, not as much. Not, not as much. Uh, yeah. We were Daddy touring was, full time through the 70s and 80s and and then pulled back a bit. Daddy went to to the University of Kentucky, got his library science degree and had this wonderful experience here with the Lexington Public Library. We should fast forward ahead to that period of time because sure. it was that because that was a, a wonderful time too. We weren't touring as much, but we were all actively involved. Why don't you talk a little bit, Ruth, about didn't Daddy ask you to come substitute for him once? When you <laughs> well, were... I did when he was working at the Lexington Public Library. At one point, he was a children's librarian, and he was going to be gone and asked if I would come substitute for him and I came and got to do do things with the children in a fun program we used books that had uh, kind of singing hand games like Itsy Bitsy Spider. And, yeah. Yeah. Like little and, finger plays. And, yeah. yeah. Had a wonderful time. So he did, he did, he was a children's library in Kentucky Room. And I think one of his favorite things was being a reference librarian mm-hmm. um, through the Lexington Public Library. That's incredible. So he wore many, many hats. He um, did. Well, he was, he was, at his core, a helper yeah. and and wanted to help people. Mm-hmm. And so it was a very natural position for yeah, him. Yeah, that's incredible. So let's talk a little bit about bluegrass music in general. It has deep roots, of course, here in Kentucky and Appalachia and many other places. But let's discuss a little bit about its longevity and how were how you guys able to reach such a wide audience? I mean, it's incredible that you guys were able to perform in in many countries in Africa as well as Europe. But there's something about bluegrass music that touches people in a different way. We are very fortunate to have lived in a time when we could become acquainted with and make friends with people who were our heroes and our inspiration, our mentors, and people who were legendary. When we were playing on the Hazard television station, a good friend, Melvin Goins and the Goins brothers, Melvin and Ray, also started having a a television show at the same time. And uh, we made friends, and Melvin told us uh, about uh, playing at these wonderful bluegrass festivals that were just starting. And he told us about going to Bill Monroe's festival at Bean Blossom and some of the others, and he said, you should, you should come. You should bring, he told Daddy, you should bring the family and come, and uh, I'll introduce you to Bill Monroe. And he did. And we made friends with Bill Monroe. Now, Bill Monroe, as people know, is the father of bluegrass music. He invented the musical style. When he was growing up, his main influences were his Uncle Penn Vanderveer, that, uh, the song Uncle Penn that he wrote that song about, and blues guitar player by the name of Arnold Schultz. And Arnold Schultz and Bill Monroe were his two main musical influences. 
And uh, he told Bill Monroe was quoted in the in the book Boss Men about him and Muddy Waters that uh, Mick uh, that uh, Jim Rooney wrote. He's quoted as saying, "If I hadn't had the mandolin, I would have tried to play blues on the guitar like Arnold Schultz." Uh, who also influenced other people. He influenced bigger influence on Merle Travis. Big. He was the Everly Brothers' father's favorite musician. He was a wonderful musician. So there, a lot of Bill Monroe's influences were blues, the old time string band music, like his uncle Penn played. He heard a lot of jazz, uh, New Orleans style. He heard a lot of country music from that from that period. And Bill always said that those were all part of the recipe that he used when he put bluegrass music together. And uh, so uh, it was wonderful. Daddy took us to meet people like Bill Monroe. We made good friends with Ralph Stanley. Ralph Stanley came and toured through Hindman, Kentucky, and would come play in the grade school auditorium and on top of the the movie theater projection booth for the outdoor drive-in movie theater places. And we made friends with, with people that helped develop bluegrass music. Don Reno came and played. We were going to play at the Pike County Jamboree every Saturday night that we could in Pike County, Kentucky. And Don Reno, Sam King brought Don Reno and Red Smiley and Bill Harrell to play there. And we made friends with people that we had only heard on on record. And Don Reno let me come and play mandolin with him for about three years and ruth filled in on bass when when he needed a bass player and we had wonderful opportunities like that so the development of bluegrass music was something that we kind of got to witness we got to see all through the 60s bluegrass music was changing it had always changed when bill monroe started bluegrass music in the 50s it was a radical new style of music we think of it now as a traditional style and there are many older elements old ballads and songs from the british isles or you know those styles are still in bluegrass music and even in modern bluegrass music and even in what they're calling new grass music, you know, and people that like Sam Bush that was, you know, has been our friend for decades. People like Ricky Skaggs, people that that play modern styles have a lot of those old roots in their music. And so so it's both old and new. It's always been changing. And through the 60s, we got to see that part of the music changing. Through the 70s, we got to see that part of the music changing. Through the 80s, 90s, and right up to the present day, when when Daddy was working at the Lexington Public Library and so forth, I got I had the opportunity to play with Jim and Jesse, uh, stars of the Grand Ole Opry in their band, and and tour with them uh, internationally and domestically. And we, I got to play music from the stage of the Grand Ole Opry more than a thousand times during that 10-year period with them in their band. And they, they were heroes of ours and became lifelong friends. Jesse just passed away at the age of 90. One or two. He was well. If he, it was in a week of his, within a week of his birthday, and he either was ninety-one or he was turning ninety-one when he passed just last year. And he developed techniques on the mandolin that are not only played on the mandolin now, cross picking, for example, and split string playing techniques that are used not only on the mandolin in bluegrass music, but in country music and in many other styles of music from all over the world. People use his techniques now to to play instruments that that he maybe never even heard. Bluegrass music has influenced other genres of music. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, and it's one incredible. thing we found while we were touring is that you don't have to already be familiar with the bluegrass music techniques. It it's a music that's friendly, and so when we were touring overseas, the language wasn't an issue because music is such a such a friendly language and it's a language that every culture has exactly every culture has music and so touring overseas playing music especially as a family from the eastern kentucky mountains i think was interesting to people whether they were familiar with the music or not 
Uh, it's a it's a friendly music. It's, it's an inclusive. All it's inclusive. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not too complicated to understand. You don't have to have studied it to appreciate it, and and just the being a part of that was incredibly meaningful to me to be a part of sharing about Kentucky and about the mountain region and the rural regions of the United States, which in a lot of countries, that's not the image yeah. of, of the Kentucky. United States exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that they might Well, you guys seen. mentioned Hindmond. Um, there's so many incredible creative artistic works that have come out of that school and, and that region. Um, so... You guys are a testament to that, and I find that so incredible that such a, you know, a small region is able to produce such artistic works from authors to musicians to poets. It's someplace that I do want to visit. A rural lifestyle lends itself to being more creative, uh, perhaps. Uh, For you know, one thing— There's you, not many distractions, I guess you could well, say. Well, that's true, and especially before the Internet, there certainly <laughs> weren't, and especially before the roads that we have now, there <laughs> certainly weren't. But um, if you live in a small community, you're you're able to— to do things. You, if if someone's going to do something, you have to do it. And so I think people grow up realizing that they can do things, and they see their family doing things, and they see it. It, it is creative, and that's also what draws communities close together. When we grow up, uh, we we develop a respect for one another, and the the arts are something that can be respected on a local level, whether or not they are nationally, whether or not politicians think it's important, whether or not somebody else thinks it's something that should happen. If you think it should happen, you can just do it. If you, you know, if you're in a small community, if you live in a larger city, there are a lot more people doing things and and things become more specialized and more. uh, But I think that's one thing about uh, the arts that because it, it draws us together and and our world is divided right now and if we want to come together one way we can do it is through the arts yeah. one and because our music community is important for example and our music community we we never used to mind if somebody voted one way or another or thought one way about this or that now people make more of that but I think that the music community can is one place we can draw together. Artistic communities can draw together, whether it's theater or or graphic arts or 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 painting literary or works. literary yes. arts or <laughs> or whatever. Ruth made friends with a young man who had just graduated from the conservatory in Cairo, who was one of the premier oud players. Uh, we we played with with musicians in England and in in Sweden and in Spain and in uh, Ruth, when we got to Burma, Ruth learned a Burmese song in a day, wow. and and sang it on the concert, and that was in. Would you like to hear a little of it? Sure, here's a little that bit of the beginning. That was in 1975. She still can remember. I That's think, parts incredible. It's la win lane to the mega lock way. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I thought since 1975, there might be a possibility that she would have forgotten part of it or would have, you know, maybe the words might not be the same as they were in 1975. And there is a, we, we have a friend that was staying with Allison L, wasn't she, from from that region. And Ruth sang it for her. She said, yeah, it's exactly, she said, I understood every word. <laughs> I was in Dallas taking an Uber trip to my hotel and, and I was talking with Uber driver and he was from Burma. 
And I said how much we appreciated our time in Burma and, and started singing the song. And he sang with me. Oh, incredible. <laughs> yeah, just a, again, testament to how music and arts really connect people across across borders and across linguistics. That is incredible. Absolutely. So talk to us a little bit about the dynamics of your of your group. Who writes the lyrics? How do you put the music to it? How long does it take you to uh, put music to the words? We do work as a team. Yeah. We're so much a team. A lot of times, if we're doing traditional material, then if it's original material we're doing, Ruth might write it, I might write it, uh, we might do it together. Ruth came to the house a few weeks ago, and we we wrote one together that we recorded actually last. What about a, well, I guess it's met, we must have written it two a month or two ago because we recorded it a week or two ago. But we we do it different different ways, different times. Okay, Alice and Al write everybody. Um, the the concept of writing came from our father. Uh, it was such a natural process. It was something you're always thinking about. Our father was so creative. He he did paper folding. <laughs> he would, and he he created uh, paper folds or made original folds that were then used uh, at the White House and used uh, on their Christmas tree. Oh, there was incredible. a see-through star that he uh, he created that uh, the Heinemann Settlement School students made um, at the request of for the White House tree. He made a whole crash scene out of paper. He made a piece, a Kentucky horse that was used on the cover of a, of a more a origami book by Robert Harbin, I believe it is. And in ma- in uh, calendars and so forth, his folds have his original folds have been used. So the idea of creating things was very natural, even though he had studied. Music. He was a music theory major at Denison University and then went to Harvard studying composition and then did graduate work in folklore at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, uh, which is where Raymond was born, uh, before moving to Heinemann to be the director of the Heinemann Settlement School. You guys are such an inspiration, of course. You'll be inducted into the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame in October. Now, that is something that we never expected. <laughs> I, I, I'm still... In all honesty, reading about your history and doing research for this podcast, I was amazed that it took this long for you guys to be <laughs> inducted <laughs> after 50 oh, years. Not at all. Um, not at all. I'm just, so... I'm just uh, sort of blown away by that. By that honor, because it's a one. The Kentucky Music Hall of Fame is a wonderful place. If you go in, Merle Travis's guitar is in there. His last guitar, the one with his name in the fingerboard. There are Exile is there. Uh, it's all kinds of music. Loretta Rose, Lynn. Rosemary Clooney Ricky is Skaggs. in there. And there, I think, since the beginning, there've only been like forty six or forty eight, maybe forty two. I don't know. There are not that many. Artists, but they're all people you know. Uh, Grandpa Jones, String Bean. They're uh, wonderful exhibits. Oh my gosh! Um, and it's Sam open Booth to the public. And what does it mean and to you guys to be among those um, names that you guys I, just listed? That's I, incredible. I can't even think about it that way because <laughs> I, I just think about it as our friends. Mm. We're in, we're we're grateful to be included in that circle of friends and musicians, but. If you if you asked me if we would ever be inducted into the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame, I would have said, "Well, no, never. <laughs> that there, that wouldn't be a thing that would happen." But I'm so grateful because it validates our father, and all the time and energy that he it validates our mother, who did our correspondence and our business. She was hard of hearing, and she didn't. Uh, sing or play with oh, us. Oh, that's but, incredible. But she did all of our correspondence, all of our... So she managed you, basically. Uh, basically. She managed the office. Yeah. <laughs> and um, she was wonderful and encouraging. She made our first stage clothes. Uh, she made the girls' outfits for a long time. She uh, was very supportive. And um, So it's for them. This is for them also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're honored 
We're so honored to get to be a part of this, the induction and the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame. We've always been so proud of Kentucky. Jessica Blankenship, who is the director of the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame, made the made made this announcement at the in, during one of our programs in Nashville last January. We were on stage, and I'd seen Jessica there, and I, I knew her, but. I didn't think about it have her being there having anything to do with us. <laughs> and so when we were uh, getting close to the end of the program, she came out on the stage and made that announcement. And um. <laughs> I was completely blown away. <laughs> what a lovely surprise. Nice. That is so nice. So when is the induction uh, ceremony? Or when are, when are you guys going? It's going to be October the 26th. Mm-hmm. It's um, open to the public, but yeah. you have to, to get tickets. Yeah. It's at Renfro Valley. Yeah. Yeah. That is incredible, and we are so honored to have Kentucky Hall of Famers <laughs> with us with us today. So, what are some of the events that are coming up for the band? What do you guys have in store? What well, we have concerts, of course, coming up. But another one of the exciting things is a new recording project. Uh, we just finished recording our new album, and we're also working actually on a kind of a legacy package of all of the albums and recordings from the 70s and 80s. Nice. So when does this album 60s, is released? And 80s. Yeah, yeah, actually starting starting with a with our, our first 45, 45. <laughs> <laughs> and through all of the albums up through through the years. Nice. Uh, so that's a fun project. Okay. And uh, both of those projects will be out this fall. This fall. Incredible. Mm-hmm. So soon. So be on the yeah. lookout. Yeah. Well, we're, we're excited about it. Ricky Wasson is uh, engineering this this new recording. And, and uh, Jeff Myers is, is working on the legacy package. Okay. Nice. Well, Raymond, you brought your guitar. Is that your guitar? Yes. Okay. Can we listen to something sure. that you want to, <laughs> sure. to share with our, with our listeners? Maybe something new or something old? or What would you like to do, Raymond? I think we should do Kentucky Wind. Okay. Kentucky Wind is a song that Raymond and our father wrote together uh, while we were touring. And it has, um, it has a lovely feel and kind of shares the concept that the music um, and the wind are shared uh, throughout the world and so the wind yeah. uh, that we feel while we're touring mm-hmm. actually was in Kentucky at one point yeah and so we share all we share the wind exactly we can share the music the wind sings an old song in Kentucky Remembered from some other time and place It brings back now and then an old time feeling Left over from its never ending race Sing to me, Kentucky wind, sing to me Kentucky wins. 
sing to me If I could only see things as the wind does In its restless journey through the land Then I'd know the meaning of its message And I'd shout it out for all to understand Kentucky wind sing to me. Wow, incredible. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for sharing this. I feel so privileged to have a little private concert here. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I think this is a perfect spot to end our podcast. Again, thank you for listening to us. You've been listening to Bruce and Raymond McLean. Well, on behalf of our entire band with Alice, our sister, and her husband, Al White, and Dax and Lewis, the whole bunch of us. And Nancy Ann and Michael and Jennifer. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Miriam and Aaron, thank you both so very much for your kind invitation and for hosting us so beautifully. Thank you. And congratulations on the induction. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.